All right. Well, thank you, everyone. <clears throat> so maybe before I get going, Jeff, I'm going to put you on the spot right away. Um, right away. Um, and we kind of got a quote up here from Jeff. Uh, Jeff was interviewed recently uh, for an article on his conservation efforts. And so maybe Jeff just kind of set the stage for us on, on resources and, uh, and this creek here and, and a little bit on the property, and then we'll, we'll jump into it. Yes. Yes, I am Jeff Putin since 1970. I've been involved in conservation of one form or another. I've farmed most of those years. I still do some farming. And uh, I farmed about every which way. Conventional farming, no-till. Uh, we're working on organic. We're not there yet. Uh, I am a conservationist. I believe I buy something and I sell things to make money, but I sell the least of my resources to make money. Everybody here has something precious in your ground or something. I find that most people don't realize that there, there's diamonds under your feet, guys. There, there are rare habitats. There are spots that are begging to be conserved, begging to be used. Um, most farmers are too busy. As you can see, I am just an old farmer. I will try to learn today, but this will be difficult. Where was I? We're, we're all, we all have something that has value. I, I farm. And all my life, I've been a hunter, and I've always appreciated ground. Uh, I planted trees many years ago, and I plant them yet today. Uh, when I bought this piece of ground, first thing all my hunting buddies said, and well, most of my farm buddies says, why you buy that crap? You gonna put cattle on it? You gonna tear it down? Oh, you're gonna log the trees. Nope. Nope, I'm going to leave it just the way it is. In fact, my wife can tell you that we spend about $5,000 a year on this 125 acres. We haven't logged a single tree off of it. I let people deer hunt it, but of course, what I like is we get young girls and young boys in there that are starting out hunting and teach them how to hunt and have the thrill of hunting. And then once you're experienced, Go out in the real world. Go fly. Uh, I was very fortunate on this piece of ground that there's a fen on it. And Derek will have to explain what a fen is because to me, I just showed everybody this wonderful bog. You know the Irish and their bogs? I bought a bog. And then we put in oxbows on this ground. And of all things, be very quiet. Be careful, don't tell any farmers this. But we, Derek and I have put in seven beaver dams. I, I don't know what the show was, but remember it said, if you build it, it will come. We're hoping for beaver. Dang this thing. But we, we've had a lot of challenges with that, too, and I'm going to ramble on the whole time if I just don't shut up and let Derek continue. That's a good segue. So if you guys couldn't tell, that is a beaver dam analog, we'll, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but just as kind of a teaser, um, again, you know, Jeff's got a unique property, and that's kind of what we want to share with you guys. Jeff's story a little bit, and then hopefully there's something in it for each of you to take away, too, in terms of uh, new information or, or really interesting habitats to, to keep your eye out for. And I'll kind of just streamline through this, just like to give you guys a little orientation on the presentation. Um, we've got some main points we'll make here, and we just really want to drill those home throughout the presentation. Um, and we'll talk, let Jeff talk quite a bit more about the prop property itself. Uh, there's lots to tell and share. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's a great piece of ground. And then, you know, kind of how Jeff and I met. So I, I work with Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and so, you know, we've, we're a private lands program. And I'm going to talk quite a bit about that here in a little bit. About what our program does and what we have to offer landowners that are interested. Uh, we'll talk specifically about Jeff's projects. He mentioned fens, oxbows, beaver dams. Um, 
some prairie stuff. Uh, so he's got a little bit of everything that we'll cover. And then uh, we'll kind of go into our closing points uh, and give you guys some resources that might be of use as well if you have land or ground and want to reach out to some folks for help. So main points um, that we just want to make, uh, and I'm going to let Jeff uh, pick up here once I kind of capture these quickly, is you know habitat restoration can increase value. So Jeff's a farmer. He's already described that. He looks at this ground um, as having many opportunities for value. Uh, certainly enjoyment. Everyone you know has their different recreational goals, uh, and Jeff's piece is unique in that it's got lots of opportunities as well. Um, and uh, habitat restoration helps with landscape resilience. So being able to handle floods, we'll talk about oxbows and the benefits they provide uh, in a minute, uh, as well as some of the other uh, habitat projects. And I guess with that, I'll, I'll lead into this next one, and that's long-term goals, or goals and long-term vision. So Jeff's kind of a unique landowner I work with in that he's really thought about his ground, and he, he's still probably developing his goals a little bit, but he's got them and he's got a long-term vision for the property. And so maybe with that, I'll let you just kind of capture what those are. One thing I learned in life, and I've, this is true 50 years ago and it's true today, keep asking questions until you get the answer you want to hear. <laughs> All right? The first person, if you go to the first person and he gives you the answer you want to hear, please let me know. That'll be the first time in my life. Just keep asking people, keep checking resources, ask, ask, ask. This, this Practical Farmers Iowa, my God, it's great. I, I came here and I didn't know what to expect. And the wealth of knowledge, teaching and in the classroom, uh, it's worth every penny. I told Jordan, Jordan, Jordan. Jordan that I had to come back next year and be a speaker because I couldn't fork out the money. <laughs> and, and we're working that out. But. Uh, Go to your NRCS. Use every recessor resource that you have and keep going. You may not know what you have. Get them on that farm. You know, we had the botanist out and he says, oh yeah, there's 47 species on this fen that don't grow anywhere but except for on a fen. Okay, I thought it was wetland. I just thought it was nothing. And Get, you're not going to know what you have until you get somebody out there to identify it. And get somebody you can work with. You have to have similar goals. You have to work together. Derek is not the first person I met. For seven years, well, let's back this off. For five years, I looked for somebody to go out on that farm. And I've had lots of people on it. And I've had lots of promises. But Derek come in there and says, we can do that. And even though my idea was not the right idea, he has taught me the right idea. He has taught me to work through what I want so that both of us get the same goal. We both have the same goal, but we go about different ways. Make sure you have common goals with your practitioner. The other thing is who's going to do the work? Now, there is nobody I know that is going to go out there and do the work for you if you don't get your butt out there and do it first. You have to show them that you're dedicated. Another thing is, is be an oak tree. Don't be a popular tree. This is long-term goals. Your ground has been there for millions of years. It's probably been 60,000 years when the profile of it came in there. And your trees, a lot of the trees or your resources on the ground have been there a long time. Don't screw it up in a year. Think, plan, plan, plan. And even though you get an answer, talk to somebody else. One of the major mistakes we made is we bought this ground and we went in the forest reserve program. I had one guy out there and says, this is the way it needs to be. He knows what he's talking about. Our goals weren't on the same page. He was thinking of, I wanted to produce lumber. Someday this, all this woods is going to be lumber. Of course, where I live in Iowa, if it's a decent tree, it's had a deer stand put in it. And anybody knows anything about lumber, I haven't got a single tree that's lumberable. But we went in there, and we did what we were told to do. 
And that was to clear areas, leave one tree to every 40 foot, and thank God we didn't do it all in one year. The next year, we realized that a lot of those trees needed the other trees for support. And the wind come through and blew a bunch down, and now we've got nice big prairies, well, not too big, 80 foot prairies in the middle of, of some of our woods. Um, yeah, and I'll just, yeah, I think, you know, so we're going to talk forever. Yeah, we'll get into some of that uh, a little bit more. You know, I think, again, trying new things. So Jeff mentioned that we have different approaches. Um, there are many different ways. And so when we talk today and I show you some of the problems, we'll call them problems, threats, uh, and the solutions that we came up with, there's lots of ways to do things. You guys all know that. Uh, sometimes you got to take a little risk, I think. Uh, and so, you know, we'll talk about what that is and our give and take a little bit. And that just to hammer home that, Sometimes you got to think outside the box um, or find different ways to compromise uh, when you're working with, with each other. Get it in writing. <laughs> Guys, get it in writing. I mean, we all talk to somebody and we have our own point of view, but in the end of the day, it better be written down because even though your coordinator comes up with an idea, there's somebody else going over it and saying, uh-uh, we can't pay for that. It doesn't work. Get it in writing. Make sure you have all the things pointed down. And, and don't think you're going to make money off of this, guys. You, you are just improving a resource you have. You are putting more money in the bank. So everyone's wondering where the heck we're talking about, right? Um, where is this property located? So Jeff and Nancy here is up front, and we'll get a photo in a second. Um, they live in Greene County. Uh, this is on the, in the North Raccoon watershed as a whole, um, but specifically on Cedar Creek here. And uh, let's see if I can find my pointer. So apologize for the colors. A um, little bit here. This is the watershed the, that they're in. This is the property. This main stem here is Cedar Creek. Uh, and then they've also got an unnamed tributary here we're going to talk about that comes in. But the, what I want to drive home here is this is obviously this watershed is dominated by agriculture. Okay, uh, row crop primarily, uh, and then it's got, of course, riparian areas um, and a little bit of prairie left to it, but, but not a whole lot. The map on the right shows you, again, just a zoomed in on the property that we're going to focus on today. It's about 115 acres, um, and here again you can see the main Cedar Creek uh, coming uh, here, and then this unnamed tributary. So everything we're going to talk about today is going to be located in this area, uh, and I guess overall, just to point out, it's within the Des Moines watershed in Iowa. So Fish and Wildlife Service, we're focused on watershed um, efforts. So we want to kind of, one of the first steps we do is figure out in what watershed we're working, where, where the drainage is, the drainage area. Uh, and that factors in big time to the habitat restoration uh, and the land cover that exists uh, in that area. Jeff, anything you want to add on location in, on this map? Show them my house. Show them my house. So right up here. Right there. Yep. And then the two oxbows in the fan? Yep, and we'll get to that a little bit, but right. they're going to be down here. So we're going to talk about the stream. We're going to talk about the oak woodland, the oak savanna, uh, and a little bit of all the habitats here in a mo moment. Um, what I'd like to do is, so one of the first things we do, of course, is look at old aerial phot photography, right? So you can see a lot from that. Uh, most of that only goes back to 1930s, and that's what we've got on the left-hand side here. Uh, and then right around the time when Jeff and Nancy bought it, 2014, this, this chunk, give or take there, uh, is on the right. And so you can kind of see, I think pretty clearly here, a couple of things. One, this unnamed tributary here is dry, right? So completely dry, not flowing. Now this is a snapshot in time, but this is an intermittent creek, or it's supposed to be, uh, or it was historically. The other thing I can notice, you can see the kind of the tree densities a little bit. So like if you focus on this little ravine here, um, you can see these are oaks, oak trees, and there's most of those old, old oak trees are still there. Um, but now, if you go to more recent times, you know, there's quite a bit of cedar trees, eastern red cedar, that are mixed in. So, not a bad thing, eastern red cedar and native trees. We're, we're going to talk about what that invasion means for oaks and oak recruitment. And you can kind of just see how this property overall, from a, from a tree standpoint, is quite a bit denser than it was historically. Um, and so those are just a couple things, like I said, we just like to point out and look at when we're first looking at a property, uh, is how it's changed. And maybe, Jeff, you can just briefly touch on kind of what you know about the history of, of that property 
um, the early settler cabin, um, and uh, talk a little bit more about the history. Okay, yeah. Well, our major, my major challenge is the amount of water coming down this stream. There's 1,600 to 1,800 acres comes down there. As he said, used to always go dry. It doesn't go dry no more. There's a lot more tile, a lot more agriculture up above us. Now, I can talk about that forever, but we got to let that die. Okay? <laughs> so uh, I like their dirt. I wish I could capture all their dirt. That's like a bank account with six people up, upstream putting money into me. Uh, I, at the present time, I just can't, can't control the urge to hold all that dirt back. Um, yes, one of the things we found on this piece of ground, in 1857 there was one hell of a snowstorm, I imagine worse than this one that we had, and there were trappers on the river, and they were up and down the river, and when we were cleaning the spot of the thorny locust, that, which was the first tree we went in there and got rid of, we had a caterpillar going in there and found a bunch of rocks, you know, ah, go pick up the rocks and that. Well, it was determined that that was one of the, not a settler, but a trapper in 1857, died in a snowstorm. And there's quite a story about that, but we found that and, and first we re-interned him, put the rocks back and the extra rocks. And then after looking, we found where his home was on the side of this hill and it's like, Wow, this is cool. You know, and all we got is a little foundation, you know. But in this story, I got to just, uh, just put this in there, you know. So we're going to put these oxbows in. I said, oh, Derek, Derek, guess what? I got this dead body on top of the hill, you know. He goes, oh. <laughs> you know, I, I plan on digging there, you know. But it was not. It was way on top of the hill. But it was like, oh, be careful what you say, you know. <laughs> and all I'll add there is now that is a registered site in Iowa for yes. that. That was not the case before. And so, again, you know, these are, it's an important part of the history, obviously. And I think, it, you know, it's something to keep your eye open for, but not to be afraid of, it's of that history. It's another little gem I found. It's a piece of history that was completely lost, yep. and we found. So kind of back to where Jeff was going with the, the intermittent creek and the drainage area and all that sediment that's coming down. That's why Jeff originally asked me out to his property was, you know, here's the, here's the situation. Uh, there is, and these are just some basic diagrams that some of you have probably all seen before, but, you know, sediment is moving primarily because of, uh, you know, uh, the lack of cover on the landscape that was once prairie, over 80% of Iowa's prairie, uh, less than one-tenth of one percent of course remains, and that's certainly the case upstream of Jeff's property where it's, it's row crops, and it's been tiled, and I'll show some pictures of that in a little bit, but we're getting incredible amounts of sediment down this system, um, and so that was one of the things Jeff wanted to capture and, um, you know, or try to, try to work on. The other, of course, is, is nutrients. Uh, water quality is a big deal in Iowa right now and of course in the, the Gulf where the hypoxia zone is. And uh, you know, Iowa is a major contributor of nitrogen um, and there is a substantial amount from runoff that's coming down this creek as well. And so kind of the initial conversation piece was, you know, I've got a lot of sediment. How do we, what can we do about that? And we've got, you know, some nutrient and water quality issues. He's too kind. <laughs> he comes out to my place and I say, hey, I want this big dam put in here, and we're going to put a waterfall that. over here, and I'm going to hold 14 acres of dirt and water back in here. And I've had Pond Builder in here, and he says in eight years, 14 acres of dirt's going to be filled up because they, through the, through the science of the world nowadays, they can tell how much dirt's coming down through there. And, you know, in 14 years, it's all going to be full. And he tells me, well. I'm from my, Wyoming in that, I've been out there, and we put beaver dams in, and we're going to build beaver dams. And yes, the first thing I said was, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean beaver. And uh, that's what we're doing, is we're putting beaver dams in. They are working. So, they are holding it back. If we build it, hopefully they come. And that's what, so, you know, Jeff's initial interest was a bigger than dam. Our program has limitations on building bigger than dams. We just don't do it. Um, and so we're, what we're trying to do again yeah. is get back to finding common goals. He has an interest in slowing down sedimentation rates, uh, improving water quality, and that happens to have impacts to some, uh, some species, wildlife species, that obviously Fish and Wildlife Service is responsible for. 
uh, like endangered Topeka Shiner, which I'll show you guys coming up here. And so, you know, initially it's, uh, it's always a conversation and trying to figure out where those common goals lie. Um, I want to point out Nancy here in the middle, who's up front. Uh, these two, again, are incredible. They're all out there doing the work, and there'll be some pictures of that. Um, but, you know, it's not you gotta, you got to discuss through things and got to have that vision a little bit of what you're looking for uh, and those goals, and then we can have that conversation. And it really helps to have a partner. I, I don't have knees that are very good, so we cut down a bunch of cedar trees. My wife is out there hooking the chain to the cedar trees. And I wouldn't be here this morning except for her ability to wind the window down, say, you're getting close to the ditch, you get move over. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not all me. It's a... It's a cooperation between us and, and she has to put up with a lot yeah they're great so just a little bit on conservation uh, vision and values Jeff uh, these are some things I captured you know from conversations with you uh, if you just want to kind of real quickly run through these are all pictures on yep they've all been taken from our house one is that Bobcat there my wife has a, a whole video on that you know yeah, that Bobcat walking through our yard um, we built a cement home and we have a, a machine shed that has cement so high on it. We built in the woods. I mean in the woods. So the bobcat has learned they're not stupid. Everybody gets their food wherever it's the easiest. He learned to walk, she learned, learned to walk around the cement foundation because every mouse likes nice and warm. And so them little mice got up against the foundation she walks around it cloop, cloop, like that eats it so she's learned to do that and guess what the coolest thing in the face of earth is once she had babies she sat the kids down on the one end and then she walked around as the little mice and rabbit come around great they got the baby and since we were in the woods and nobody's ever hunted in our area bobcats because it's illegal to hunt them they didn't care you know they looked at us we're standing less than 50 foot away from that bobcat. In the back, I have what I call a wildlife feeder. It's an old pig feeder. I feed birds 365 days a year. I feed deer and turkey and everything that comes up every day except for hunting. In, in hunting season, I don't fill it up just because I don't want the problem. But uh, these are turkey come right up to our back door. Just kind of see that big buck there and a ton of birds. We have a lot of fun seeing birds in our house. Uh, we have a unique home too. Yeah, yeah, so you know just capturing the quotes that Jeff has said, you know the, the conservation there's the key uh, and their long-term interest and that's what our program does so I, I got to give you the pitch real quick. Um, so I don't know who knows much about Fish and Wildlife Service but our mission is working with others so in this case you know Jeff and Nancy and lots of other agencies that we've consulted with on this property. Uh, and we're the only agency that really focuses on fish, wildlife, plants as the primary mission um, for uh, conservation activities. Uh, and I specifically work for the Partners for Fish and Wildlife program under Fish and Wildlife Service, which is a private lands specific program where we're working with landowners who are volunteering to do habitat conservation. There's no, we're not making them. You know, Jeff contacted me or I never would have gone to his property. I would have never known Jeff probably. So it's completely voluntary. We're looking to do things as efficiently as possible, and I'm gonna talk about that as we go on to the presentation. Uh, and we offer cost share financial uh, dollars for certain projects, and we obviously provide technical assistance, what to do, what, what not to do, management type plans, that kind of thing. And the key at the bottom, federal trust resources, if you don't know, that is threatened and endangered species, migratory birds, or refuge lands, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Wildlife Refuge lands, uh, those things that are held for the American people in trust um, by the government, essentially, that we manage uh, for the benefit of, of Americans. And so our program has a strategic plan, and I, I have to touch on this because we're, we're not just out helping out everyone, unfortunately. We are focused on those resources that need the help the most. Uh, in my area, which is the whole Des Moines lobe here, and Jeff, you know, his property is right over here, um, those are primarily the three species you see up there, monarch butterflies, um, through a special initiative. Migratory birds like the, the bobolink. And then on the bottom here, and we're going to talk quite a bit about this, is Topeka shiner, which is an endangered fish uh, that occurs on Jeff's property and uh, other streams in Iowa as well. 
So just real quick, what happens? Jeff called me up. I go out, do a site evaluation with Jeff. We talk about things. We see if there's common goals. Um, and then if there is, like there was in this case, then we help do all the technical side of things, project design, permitting, uh, construction oversight, if there's contractors involved. Uh, we always evaluate projects after they're, they're completed with the landowner, uh, and then we continue to be a resource um, for and Jeff. And that's not it, though, guys. After that resource, after he's done doing all this work, and he does a lot of work, you have to maintain. Yep. And a lot of times there's an easement put in there, too. So there's a little give and take, but it's well worth it. And that's the landowner side that Jeff's referring to. So our program requires a landowner agreement, minimum of 10 years, where the landowner is saying we're going to do this habitat restoration and we're going to maintain it for at least 10 years. Sometimes we do 15, sometimes 20, sometimes forever. Depends on the landowner and what they want. Um, and in Jeff's case, most of them I think were 10 years. But that you know the landowner is going to maintain that after we put the money and effort in uh, to keep that habitat restoration going. Um, and then any maintenance requirements or other contributions are outlined in that agreement as well. So that's just kind of the technical side, just got to throw it in there. Now we'll focus on kind of those habitats that exist on Jeff's property and talk about specific actions uh, for the rest of the talk here. I just want to bring one other thing up. So what's my goal? Well, one thing is to save as much as I can. That's natural. It's already there. I just have to enhance it. And if you want Derek or somebody like there, make sure that you make sure that you tell them that you're serious about this and you are going to take care of what you you started. Uh, I hope someday this will be a learning center. I hope someday that we'll have people on this and they'll be able to see Oak Savannah. Um, we got the <laughs> oxbows, we got the fin. So that's perfect segue. So just property, yep. these maps are the same. Uh, one just got polygons filled in here. Uh, so you can, and you can kind of see the acres and the legends here on the bottom. But Oak Woodland, basically on this north facing slope. Uh, Oak Savannah and a couple different areas on more south facing sides. Uh, he's got two alfalfa fields currently that we'll talk a little bit about his future plans. He does have some prairie uh, including some remnant uh, that goes into the oak savanna here. This fen that we're going to talk about is located right here on the hillside, right next to the major road here. And then he's got now two oxbows that were restored here that we'll talk about. If you look at this property right next door, there's another restored oxbow uh, that Fish and Wildlife Service did on his neighbor's land uh, many years ago. Uh, and so these are all rare, rare habitats in Iowa anymore. Uh, I mentioned how rare prairie is. Oak savanna is the same. It's usually been encroached by invasive species uh, or has been torn down and farmed. Uh, and oxbows are filling with sediment at a super fast rate given all the runoff uh, and issues we have. And uh, prairie um, and the fen, which is a, a rare wetland type, um, they are extremely rare. Um, and we'll talk more about those when we get to the projects. So Jeff, just real quick, before I got involved, Jeff was already doing conservation on the property. He started with his oak woodland here. So Jeff, maybe just a quick overview of the things you did in the oak, oak woodland. Well, we, one of the first things we did, we got rid of the thorny locusts. We couldn't find a, a purpose for that. Also, cedar trees do have a purpose. Uh, everything in its place and everything in its time. Uh, I am not very ambulatory, I can't walk around, but I have a ranger. And I love to take kids around through the woods. We have oak, we have uh, walnut, and several other trees, including the shagbark hickory and the shellbark hickory. And I just love taking, getting kids out in the woods and we go up to a tree and say, this is a bad house. And you see that it comes out like that and I explain to them, you know, that that's how we keep bats in the woods and blah, 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 and this is, a, this is a cherry tree, this is that, you know, and try to keep their interest, which is difficult for kids. But if you notice earlier, well, in that one there, you see the, the mushrooms? Uh, that was on our place too. We, tons of different mushrooms. It's so much that you overlook in a day. A good friend of mine said that his grandmother, the most important thing in his life was his grandmother on a day then he was born measured off a square foot in the woods and says, 
write everything down you see in this and don't come back until you're done. And he goes, oh, God. You know, dirt, leaves. And he says, an hour later, he says, I had the whole front full. You know, that this was in there, that was in there, and he says, you start looking at it. We overlook the small things in life, and that's what we need to show people. Uh, my ground isn't that unique. Our ground isn't that unique. But we're looking at everything and showing people what we have and saying, hey, it's like the fin. I've explained it to three or four people, and two of the people said to me, well, I've got a fin. I said, well, what'd you do with it? Oh, we farm that. You know, that used to be a cattle pasture, and now that's true here, you know. Or, and it's like, I've never heard what a fin was in my life before, but there's not many left. Yeah, so good segue. So, you know, just through talking with Jeff, we were looking around on his property, um, and he had some of my uh, other Fish and Wildlife Service folks out of his property before and other many other staff like we've talked about. And so we got to look in, and uh, sure enough, he's got basically a fen, which is a hillside seep, essentially. It's rare, uh, Iowa's rarest wetland type. Um, they're extremely rare, usually pretty small in size, unlike some wetlands, quarter acre to 20 acres, usually maximum. Um, but most of them have all been tilled under. Uh, they've either been tilled under, they've been sprayed, you know, weedy uh, type habitats, or they've been otherwise destroyed. Uh, this one, like I said, is right up against a major roadway. So hard to see on the map, but this little dot and then this major roadway. And the roadway probably actually cut off the very toe end of this fen historically, uh, if you go back far enough. And so, you know, I guess what I just want to point out, and I'll let Jeff kind of talk more about it, on the fen here, and I apologize, I don't have a lot of great great pictures, but you can see cedar trees out in the middle of the fen. Um, cedar trees are very adaptive. That's what makes them excellent competitors. They can, they can grow in the craziest places. Uh, and I don't, again, cedar trees in the right place, great thing. We didn't want them growing out there because they do shade out all the native uh, plants that would otherwise occur. And these are pretty small at this point, but you can see on the side, there's some pretty big trees and they were encroaching uh, pretty significantly from the sides. And so Jeff and Nancy and, and some labor they had actually went out and cut down the trees there on their own and really thinned it out. So our goal wasn't to get rid of every cedar tree. It was just to really thin it out uh, and basically give sunlight back to this fen, which has a very unique plant community on it. Uh, and through this project, we had brought the DNR botanist out to actually take a look at the plant species like Jeff alluded to earlier uh, and to catalog this, so to get this on uh, their list of, of known fen sites uh, because there are so few uh, remaining fens left in the state. Did you want to add anything? Oh, you know, I mean, I'll add to anything. <laughs> so if you walk on this, it's like a bouncy house. You can see yeah. little, little tufts of water everywhere. And that's weird to start out with. You, you're not going to be able to drive on it, but you can walk on it, and, and it's kind of cool. Kids like it, but make sure they're careful. Another thing is these little hoof prints or these little spots with water in it, you'll see a little oil sheen on them all. And I've asked, what the heck is that? You know, is there a spill or what? And they said, no, through the capillary movement of the water going under the ground and the minerals and all that, that almost all fens had this little oil sheen because uh, Kenny, what's her first name? Alicia. You, Alicia Kenny. Yep. Says, oh, just got done in an Iowa State with a class. That, that, that's what a fan is, you know? And uh, that was a couple of cool things that, that we did on it. Uh, in 1960, or in the early 60s, a guy wanted to improve this ground, so he got a cat stuck in the side of it. And to this day, you can see the tracks. You can see where the track was here, the track was there, and through the middle of it. And we've done a little restoration of it, but it's coming back. But, you know, you think the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, that's a long time ago. So that's what I'm telling you guys. Be careful because what you do is going to control the future for a long, long time. So what, you know, what, what's, what we were able to do is, again, take the cedar trees that were encroaching, move them off, really get the flowers, hard to see in the photo, but a chance to really bloom, which is obviously great for pollinator habitat. Um, and the plant diversity should recover over time as well. So Jeff mentioned, you know, and I, I mentioned too, one of the threats to these is chemical spraying. A lot of folks see weeds on them like thistle or other things that get sprayed. 
Um, they're pretty resilient if given the time and, and they don't continue to get sprayed that they'll bounce back and if the woody trees are kept at a minimum. And so the diversity here should continue to increase um, considerably. And in the dead of winter, there's green. That water coming out of the ground is warm and it promotes warm season grasses or warm season sedges? Yep, it, sedges, yep. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so top photo here is looking towards the main road, um, and it's actually standing on top of the fen. So th this fen's only a quarter acre in size. I'm not sure if I mentioned that. It's, it's super small. Um, but this is actually the, the vegetation community that now exists, you know, and that, that was growing last season on the fen. Um, and ironweed is the primary purple flower you're seeing in that photo. And then... This is a, a photo looking up towards that hill and towards the fen. So the road would be on your right-hand side. And um, this, what you're seeing in the foreground here is an oxbow that we're going to talk about in a minute. And so what you got is you've got oak savanna on the hillside here. This is a really, really nice uh, steep area, uh, a bluff essentially. That's a couple hundred feet in height. And then on, fens occur on kind of that middle ground on a slope. So essentially you're getting... Um, movement, capillary movement of water, like Jeff said, out of the ground kind of before you get down to the floodplain itself in this case. And then down in the floodplain here, you're seeing what is essentially an oxbow that's been restored. That's part of the river, uh, river floodplain itself. So I only have a quarter carat fan, diamond. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I'll just mention you know, cost, share, cost share wise. So Jeff and, and Nancy and their, their staff basically did all the tree removal. And then we just helped pay a small amount to have all the cedar trees piled so they could be burnt off the fen. Uh, and this was just a good way for us to compromise with each other on, you know, we got some estimates to remove the cedar trees. Estimates from contractors were in the $4,000 range. Super expensive, honestly, for what is basically a couple acres of cedar removal. Jeff, was, Jeff and Nancy are willing to do the work, which is something we look for, actual physical labor, and find a way to do it. And then we help provide some essentially equipment money to have the, the cedar trees piled, so. Yeah, so like he said, about 4,000 some odd dollars, you give us $2,700, we cut the trees down, and then you got the skeletons to deal with. We had a cat come in, take care of the skeletons. Thank you, Derek. Yep. So now my favorite part, beavers. Okay, so uh, no one got up and left the room yet, which is good. I don't get a lot of people real interested in beavers in Iowa, uh, and so it was pretty unique to run into Jeff and Nancy who were semi-interested. So what I want to point out here is, first on the map, um, these photos are taken looking off Jeff's property, off the road, essentially looking to a neighbor's. Uh, but this is a Cedar Creek floodplain, so it gives you a really good picture of flood stage on the right and normal flow on the left. And what I believe is probably one of the most beautiful things ever is this beaver dam on the left-hand side. It is perfectly engineered um, for this system. And so, you know, we took this as kind of an example of, um, well, one, we knew beavers were in the area. So when Jeff and Nancy started talking about sediment and that kind of thing, beavers were the original sediment basins, beaver dams. So behind this beaver dam, it is capturing sediment uh, naturally. Um, and would then help build up this channel or build, build up the riverbed so that it could, the river could reach flood stage a little bit easier. Uh, this beaver dam was removed by the county because most counties do not like beavers, even though it's causing zero damage, zero issues a month after that photo was taken. Uh, but the point for me was that was a good indication that beavers were in the area. And Jeff and Nancy wanted beavers back on their property. Um, and so you know, we could relocate beavers, or in our case, we were just trying to encourage them, and that's what we're going to talk about, is give them a place where they can, they can do their thing naturally, really help restore the ground, uh, create ideal habitat, uh, and not be a nuisance uh, to, I guess, uh, you know, the county or others. Um, so with that, just to kind of put everything in reference, um, that again was looking this direction, is right by the road here. So this unnamed tributary here um, that we've talked about before is where we decided to do beaver dam analogs. They're a very popular practice, perhaps the most popular practice out west right now for restoring stream systems. Beavers, you know, again, the original engineer, 
Uh, mostly what they do, at least from a habitat standpoint, is exactly what we want. They slow water down, they let sediment deposit, uh, they improve water quality uh, because of that slowing down of the water, uh, and they create great habitat for things like wood ducks, of course, uh, which are a migratory bird uh, that Fish and Wildlife Service is interested in, and in this case for Topeka Shiner, which is a small minnow fish about three inches long that's endangered in the state of Iowa and a few other states. Um, that occurs in Cedar Creek here. Uh, it's actually critical habitat for this fish, and they, they work their way up in these tributaries as well to reproduce. So from my standpoint, when Jeff you know, started talking about sediment, water quality, this was kind of a natural fit as an opportunity to try something that almost no one in Iowa is willing to try, uh, at least that I've talked to, except for maybe one other guy I'm working with, and uh, give, give beavers a chance. have to talk about Carson Rose right now. Carson Rose is a 12-year-old boy that helps me. We're, we're improving these beaver dams, and he's out there with a five-gallon buck catching minnows. And, you know, all that's so cool, you know, and that. He gets his bucket full of minnows or a bunch of minnows, and he takes it over to Derek. And look, lo and behold, yeah, you better let these minnows go. There are some Topeka shiners in it. You know, it's like, wow. <laughs> you know, he was so cool to catch something that almost extinct. Yeah. Yep, so here's the system, here's our problem, uh, at least from my perspective on the Stream Creek itself. This is the very source, uh, the start of the creek, which is all agriculture upstream. Pretty flat, actually, but these are all tile pipes, and these are big 36-inch individual pipes coming in. Less significant. than two miles away. Less than two miles away, so significant. And then, of course, as you go downstream, this is on Jeff's property, you get severe bank erosion, right, sloughing. Um, and this is just kind of showing the flood water. It knocks down the grass, obviously, once it reaches that. But the problem is, is that we're draining a much greater area in this creek than ever it was drained before, and it's got substantial flows most of the year now. At the beginning of our property to the end of our property, I think it's 32-foot drop. So it, it comes to going down there, and, the, and water cuts. Yep. And then finally it levels off towards the end. So that's a huge challenge, too. Yeah. So what do we do? Well, we took the designs that they've done out west. There's a lot of different things we can do to evaluate a site and whether it's worthwhile, but Jeff's grade is actually suitable to uh, encourage beaver recolonization. Um, but in our case, what we're doing is trying to create an analog beaver dam, uh, an example beaver dam, um, based on design that we saw from the actual beaver, which is just, thank you, uh, wood, vertical wood posts that are driven into the, into the creek bottom. Um, and then interwoven with willows. They're about as simple as you get. We built seven of these on Jeff's property in about a day. That's about all the time it takes. The, the challenge, of course, is the maintenance. So the reason we want beaver also is they do all the work to maintain them. It gets to be quite a bit, and they haven't recolonized yet for Jeff and I and, and folks to go out and re rebuild them. But still, we're talking a couple hours a year to go in and weave some more branches and to make some, some modifications. And so... It, this is just showing the same site. This is just one example looking downstream, and you can see it hits this hard corner here, so we're trying to slow the water before it hits this bank. Uh, and then this is looking upstream, and you can see it's a pretty straight stretch. Uh, so we're trying to, again, slow that water and capture sediment um, before it hits that corner and takes out more of that corner there. Um, I'm going to move through these pretty, pretty quick here because we are, I think, moving through time. But here's a different site, um, and looking upstream and downstream again, and so you can kind of see, we're not building up. So Jeff's original idea was to build a dam, or an earthen dam across this whole thing. You could do that, but it'd probably blow out. And it, and it still can be done. It can be engineered. Um, but we're trying to do this in steps. And if you saw that beaver dam on that first slide, it was very low to the river stream bottom. So one of the things we learned, we tried going pretty high initially. Uh, and we got blown out with some floods pretty quickly. And so we're really only taking it a foot or two at a time. We're trying to capture sediment a foot or two at a time. And it's hard to tell in these photos, but we actually have over a foot of sediment that was captured in basically one spring runoff right behind that storm. They and work. They work. Um, and they've held up to what are bank full flows, so completely topped out in that bank. That's a seven-foot bank. And there's no problem. We're not losing posts anymore. We're not losing the whole structure at all. And we're able, just like that beaver dam, I didn't point out great, but the original beaver dam, we can direct flows just by engineering our little elevation breaks so that we're taking pressure off the bank here and we're pushing it around that corner, but we're really trying to build up that stream bed. 
And I'll just show one more example. This, I think, captures it perfectly what beaver dams did all over the country is slowed water, so you get pools, okay? Beaver dams are still leaking. It's not stopping any fish movement in this case for small minnows or anything. And you can see downstream it goes into a, a pretty steady riffle, but it's creating these pool habitats, which are great for waterfowl, great for fish. Uh, and because we're slowing that water down, now we're giving the, the chance for nutrients like nitrogen to be taken out of the system. Uh, and captured phosphorus in the actual stream uh, sediment that's coming downstream. And they sound cool. And they sound cool. They do. Um, so just, you know, this is experimental on just property. Um, we just wanted to try it because no one else, uh, like I said, that I've worked with has really been open to trying these. They are cheap, um, but they create this amazing diversity. And we haven't had beavers recolonize yet, but I would say there's a good chance, because they are downstream, that we'll get them to at least come up occasionally during the flood events and, and help us build. We'd have beavers right now except for one major problem. They like corn better than they do tree roots. And this is true. you're going to build your house where your food source is. We tried putting, I know we planted close to 3,000 shagbark willows in there, but another problem is, is when you plant habitat, habitat comes. And we have between 50 and 60 deer out there daily, just during the winter for sure. During the summer, probably about 20. And they love willows. Yeah. Out of 3,000 willows that, one, two, three, probably six of us put in the bank over a quarter mile long, I have a hell of a time finding one or two of them that made it. Yeah. And as soon as they get green, they get that little leaf on it, and that's like a flag, and they eat them right off. Always challenges that are unexpected. Do we have a question? Question? Nope. Okay, yep. I think, yeah, we've got just uh, five, ten minutes left here. Um, so I just want to go to Oxbow's real quick. Uh, An Oxbow is an old river meander. So on the upper left, this is what the channel used to do. It naturally straightened out. This is what happens with rivers over time. They do naturally straighten. And what is left is what we call an oxbow, uh, an oxbow or a, a, a river scar. So it's the old river meander. And what's happening is these, again, because of sedimentation and runoff, uh, especially from egg fields um, and that lack of prairie cover to hold the sediment, is these are filling up at a super fast rate, um, much quicker than they would historically. And unfortunately for this fish, Topeka Shiner, they rely on those off-channel habitats to reproduce. And so when they you know, when they fill up with sediment, they're no longer available uh, to Topeka Shiner to, uh, to reproduce. And so this is just another diagram showing that. You have essentially the river channel and an oxbow scar that's dry because it's full of sediment. It doesn't hold water anymore. Once we restore them, it's now connected to the river during flood events, and it holds water even after the flood event is over. And that's what we're looking for is that diversity of habitat for these fish and, and for waterfowl. Um, Turtles, all kinds of different things utilize these back, backwater habitats. So the problem's pretty simple. Dries out. If it, if it holds any water at all, they usually dry out because this has probably got four feet of settlement runoff from fields in it. So normally this would be five, six feet deep. Of course, once it goes dry, fish die. So on Jess' property, he's got two locations where we've restored oxbows. You can see those in the upper right here. Um, they're down kind of by the Cedar Creek here. And this just shows, um, these are just photos before, which you can see here is completely dry. There's no water standing here. Put in this summer. Put in the summer, yep. On the right-hand side, that's why you don't see much native grass yet and, and stuff. All we do, go in, excavate out that sediment that was in that old oxbow scar um, and give a chance to hold water again. Uh, and this is just another view looking towards that oxbow. So here's the main river. And once the floodwaters come up, it connects with what is now the restored oxbow here, and it'll, it'll hold water, and then the fish get a chance to move back and forth. And another example of that is, uh, this is just on the other side of the creek. Um, so again, it's, it's river floodplain, not holding any water. Very simple restoration, take sediment out. Um, this is a mix of rainwater right now and groundwater because the stream hasn't uh, flooded yet. And once it floods, the fish move in extremely quickly. Uh, now we've got functional river floodplain habitat. Again, adding value to your ground. Yep. So if you care about nutrients, oxbows remove 45 to 90% of nitrates, uh, which is 
uh, an incredible amount. They're a wetland, essentially, and so if you give them enough time, they remove nitrates, um, and they are now an approved practice under the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy, which means funding is available. Uh, and then, just mention quickly, there's, they store tons of flood water, over a million gallons per one acre of Oxbow, so huge flood mitigation, natural flood mitigation. And then I mentioned the habitat that exists um, for fish, for birds, um, a lot of different uh, species utilize these. And our program, along with NRCS and other programs, will help um, provide funding for these restorations. Yes, it was your office and EQIP. Yes. We went through EQIP, yep. and it was pretty much 100%. We, we did a lot of prep work in that ourselves, but when we were done, there was no out-of-pocket cash. So... I'll just end here. I think this is pretty much the last slide. Future projects. Jeff's got some more uh, cedar tree removal to do. You can see this area has been removed from trees, this oak savanna, and this area has not, and that's solid um, cedar trees which are encroaching and preventing oak trees from reproducing. These are the alfalfa fields we mentioned that Jeff's going to enroll on CRP, so that'll be restored to native tall grass prairie eventually. And then Fish and Wildlife Service can also help provide signage so Jeff and Nancy want this to be an educational uh, type of site, and so we'll help provide signage here this year so that they have some signage to describe the projects as well. Make it fun for kids. If you really want something to last, make it fun for kids. We started a pumpkin roll. We have a big hill, and we go to Walmart or someplace like that and get their pumpkins after usually Thanksgiving. And... Uh, in doing that, you let these kids roll a pumpkin out of the back of pickup and it rolls down that hill. Uh, next year, they're back. So I, I think just to wrap it up here, you know, Jeff's point on asking questions. Jeff's always asking questions. Hey, what about this? Can we do this? Um, and not just to me, but to many people. Is there money for that? Is there money for that? Okay. If you don't ask the questions, you might not, never know. Be patient. You know, we're still learning on all this stuff, uh, and it takes, you know, many years to get the results that you're after. Uh, that long, the goals and the long-term vision are really important. Uh, and habitat restoration uh, on the farm scale is really important uh, for all the reasons we've talked about, and it does add value um, as well. I never regret going into the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, um, and this stuff will be available. There's, if you just search our program, you'll find all kinds of frequently asked questions on the Partners for Fish and Life program. Um, and my contact information, I think, is in the, the resources for this. Um, if you also just search, uh, Iowa State um, has a website for people like me that are throughout the entire state of Iowa. There's equivalents for me and uh, many of our partners. And so you can click on a county and get the names of foresters and biologists and all kinds of folks. Um, so pretty simple search. You can come up and ask afterwards if you have questions on that. And I think that's... That's the presentation. We'll start right in front. Sediment that um, you dug out of the axle, what did you do with it? Yeah, so typically we're trying to get all the sediment out of the floodplain. In Iowa, it's regulated by the 100 year floodplain, so we're trying to get it out of the, that 100 year floodplain. In Jeff's case, you could see kind of the disturbed soil, so we try to get that up on the benches above that floodplain or completely removed to farm fields. So a lot of the restorations I do, we put this back on the farm field. It is some of the best stuff you will ever see. And I've actually, I mean, this is somewhat anecdotal. We're looking at doing research. I mean, I've seen soybeans grow in this stuff after we've put it back in a field that are like chest high. Uh, the, they're super nutrient rich, of course, because it's got nitrogen and phosphorus in it. And so we try to get it up on farm fields or others. Potentially. The huge cost with oxbow restoration is sediment removal. So the farther you have to truck it or haul it, that's where your costs are. Digging it out, I had a contractor tell me, take big yellow machine, dig hole. I mean, that's pretty much it. It's the closest thing you get to a pond that's natural. I think there are markets in certain places. You know, with our agency, we've got to be careful about how we do that. We really leave it to the landowner. We've had landowners that sell it. Um, they'll pile it and sell it. Um, so we give that flexibility to the landowner. It's a resource. Yeah, huge resource. <laughs> oh, go ahead. No, yeah, okay, we'll stay to the side. Are you testing the water quality and like when you're damming it, is it keeping like nitrates in that area? 
So, you know, the way beaver dams work is beavers are essentially creating a wetland type behind those dams um, that usually takes years to develop, right? So what removes nitrogen specifically is usually plants, emergent plants, cattail, bulrush, that type of thing. Uh, phosphorus is being stored in the sediment itself that's holding place. Um, so in Jeff's particular case, we talked about doing some direct monitoring. In all honesty, the science exists. These are proven strategies from all over the country. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, to monitor it on a site-by-site -site basis is not always, you know, cost-effective for us. Excuse me one second. The question was, are we testing the water, right? Okay. Yeah. Yes. And so uh, we have not tested Jeff specifically uh, for this. That is something we can go back and do. But, you know, of course, the ideal scenario is you test it before and then after you've done these techniques. So we're, I mean, again, from my standpoint, science is there. We're confident. Uh, and what it's doing, but we don't have a site-by-site -site case to say we've reduced it this much at Jeff's property. Yeah. So, how long has it been since you took the first clear in? First, yep. First beaver dam? How long has it been since we put the first beaver dam in? Uh, that would have been 2017, uh, November of 2017 we actually lost that one so then we did all seven the next in 2018 so it's not it's basically been a full year uh that we've we've done those yeah um, because i have creeks in and i have a dam and they seem to the neighbors give me lots of water too and <laughs> took out the one that the beavers put in yeah so Yeah. And, and we fight them all the time trying to get them to go away because they try to jam up our output. So that's a challenge so with I'm beaver. I'm going to talk to you. Yeah. Is that the best way to find out more about this is to talk to this group or what? Yeah, absolutely. We can talk afterwards. The, the challenge with beaver that you pointed out is they don't build necessarily where you want them to, right? <laughs> So that's, that's the challenge, and they're not for everyone. That's not what I want to imply, although they were all over the state of Iowa historically. Um, but they are, unfortunately, a nuisance to a lot of people where they build where you don't want them. Everything yeah. in its time and everything in its place. That's I not the place for beaver. They love this, or, I mean, the sound of the water is what draws them, and you just have to put the water sound where you want them to be. And so that... That's a great point. That is exactly what we're doing with beaver dam analogs is we are creating that sound essentially. That is part of that drawing uh, of beaver. Yes, sir. Um, what, do you, what do you see as uh, the long-term options here? And by long-term, I mean longer term than you. Uh, how, uh, how do you see this land being preserved for the next generation and the next and the next? How am I going to keep this going? Is that close enough? Yeah. Okay. Conservatorship. I've been looking into this. You know, you have the, what's it called, Derek? I'm sorry. Oh, the conservation easement program. Conservation easement. You get tax breaks for that. Well, I don't need tax breaks, but my kids and grandkids probably do. And so there's like White Rock Conservatory. I want to turn this into a conservatory on the long side. And if it's a, a educational place for kids, it'll have a benefit, it'll have a tax breaks for generations to come. So I won't make a dime off of it probably, but I'm putting a big bank account out there and the government isn't putting a lot of money into my ground, but they're giving me tax breaks. Oh, sure. Yeah, so there are, um, there's a lot of variety on conservation easements. Essentially, every property has um, rights with it. So minerals, groundwater, um, grazing, whatever it might be. And so a conservation easement is an agency, perhaps like uh, NRCS or myself with Fish and Wildlife Service, we would go in and say, we're going to buy these rights, meaning, okay, we're going to buy your right to farm the ground, meaning it can never be farmed again but you still own it. You still get to hunt on it. 
you still get to do other things. And so an easement is j basically just uh, taking, you know, taking certain straws away um, that exist, like, like grazing or, or cropping, and allowing other practices. And in conservation easements, that means hunting. You know, recreational type stuff is usually still allowed, uh, just not the farming or, or more of those types of things. And so they're paid for. Uh, they would, we would pay, essentially, to take those rights from that land, uh, but the landowners still own the land under a conservation easement. I've got to say one thing, and we've got to get to this gentleman back here. Um, <laughs> You can't do anything from beyond the grave, but like my grandfather did in 74, he put a pond in and got a 99-year conservation easement on it. That pond's there today. That ground's been sold, but that pond's there today. Yep. That's a great question. So, Excuse me one go second. ahead, Jeff. Can you bundle programs? Is that your question? Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to get to see what the best option is. I don't know if it's CRP or you or whatever. Yep, so the, and there are big differences, and there's a lot of different agencies that do different conservation work, so it's a great question. So um, our program, Fish and Wildlife Service Partners Program, we are a partner program, and we are able to partner with federal agencies, state agencies, nonprofits, anyone, essentially. However, certain other agencies, federal agencies, may limit that option, meaning they may not allow us to put additional federal dollars on their federal dollars. So take CRP, okay? CRP is going to pay you, it's a rental program, to take land out of production. Our program doesn't pay rental rates. We don't do annual payments. Um, but we can help with NRCS if they allow it, and it's kind of a by office type of deal, to add more seed diversity to your seed mix. Uh, to restore a wetland that otherwise might not be restored under that CRP contract. That's where we come in. And our program, like I said, that, that's our goal is to help the landowner get as many different programs as they can that are allowed by, you know, by that, that ground program so that they get the restoration they're, they're after. And you have cost here too, as you said. That's right. Oh, cost yep, so yep, potentially can be. It just depends on the project yeah. and, you know, what the goals are and what CRP is covering. We can't double pay for something, of course. But if there's something that otherwise might not be accomplished, or we can make it even better than the baseline CRP, we can usually do that. And before you do it, make sure you get it approved. <laughs> yes. In writing. Yeah, it is true. Yes. In writing. It's not donated, so we would actually, we or NRCS or other federal agencies or even nonprofits would pay you for those rights that you're losing. So you just said it, you're losing some value. Well, you're getting paid up front for that value. And there's different easement time frames, 30 year perpetual, meaning forever, 99 plus years. And so your payment rate is based on how long you're losing those rights for. Um, and so that the tax write-off is actually a separate thing. Certain programs also allow tax write-offs, meaning because you're giving up certain rights that you then also get some tax benefit from. Unfortunately, this is a huge, huge topic. Not, I can't really accomplish it in a short time, but so, PFI does. Right, so we have some resources on our website about easements, and I'm happy to answer questions about easements, but Derek mentioned that they are very broad. They can look very different. So, you know, the government might pay you for an easement or you can donate an easement to like a land trust organization. Generally, I would say if you're getting paid for the easement, the tax benefits aren't going to be quite as great, right? So um, we have an article about this that's in our most recent magazine. You can take a look at that and I'm happy to answer questions. I told Jorgen he'd be taking this microphone away from me before we were done. <laughs> Excuse me, lady in back.
Absolutely. Yep. So great question. The question is, you know, there, she's working with INHF, uh, a nonprofit Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation, to do an easement. Can she also take advantage of the partners program? Yes. We actually do things specifically with Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation when they own land sometimes for, for brief times. Um, and so we can work with private landowners that have that easement as well. Um, we still have to have a 10-year agreement, but we just match it up with your agreement that you've already got with Iowa Natural Heritage. And it's just to kind of reiterate that we're providing additional resources and we expect you to follow our recommendations if you're going to you know, take funding from us or utilize funding that we provide. Sure. So. It's not an easement. It's basically a firm handshake. We do have some ability to come back and say you didn't follow through, but we want to work with people like Jeff and Nancy that are reliable, and so we're pretty picky on that end and that are willing to do the work. But we're not, we're not doing an easement. We're not paying for rights. Uh, it's completely voluntary. Uh, and after the 10 years, I mean, you maintain ownership that whole time. After the 10 years, you can do whatever you want. Then you can tear it out potentially if you wanted to, but we're probably going to screen that up front before we sign an agreement with you. Um, so, so far, how much uh, money have you invested in your property? $5,000 a year, seven years, $35,000. How much have I spent per year? Nancy, would you mind <laughs> leaving? <laughs> At least $35,000. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. So, yes. So there, there are a lot of options. Um, there are a lot of challenges with oak savannas. In this case, you said non-native grasses, um, and of course, the challenge being that you don't want to impact the the trees and stuff that are there that are native. So, you know, what I didn't get to mention that I should mention is fire in almost all these landscapes is super critical. Okay. And with fire, you can actually, without even in any herbicides, you can shift that component, if the seed bank is still there, from non-native grasses to a more diverse native mix. We could also provide seed, sometimes we'll, inter, we'll call it interseeding and provide seed. I, I hesitate to get too much more detail because without seeing the site, you know, everything is a little bit um, variable. But there are, I, I do want to mention fire and how important it is to these landscapes and that, that there are techniques for these more challenging uh, habitats where you don't want to you know, kill off everything and start over to do that. And I think Jeff's done a little bit on I that end. i got to jump in here. Bur oak blight. Bob, <laughs> burning really helps slow that down. Don't know why, but it works. But if you're burning your wood area, make sure you don't have, you have a lot of water around a shag bark hickory because they will catch fire very easily. They make good chimneys, and we were very faithful Indians for about an hour or so because it caught the shag bark hickory on fire, and nice little flames went out, little embers for about 30, 40 foot around that, and we're all going like this. So, yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. I think we're about of time. Okay. So